I'm like photobombing your uh Welcome back. Uh, <clears throat> so last time we introduced dynamic programming as our first sort of algorithm for, I, I hope I convinced you that a pretty simple algorithm could actually sort of understand the dynamics of our nonlinear system in a way that was very non-intuitive, you know, looking at the equations of motion. Uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of things though that I didn't like about what we had to do last time. Everything was discrete. Everything, every equation I wrote on the board basically assumed that I had a discrete set of states, a discrete set of actions, and I was in discrete time. And I kind of swept under the rug the fact that I was showing you something that looked like a continuous function that worked for the pendulum and everything like that. Um, today we're going to resolve that uh, inadequacy. So we're going we're to do the continuous version of that. So we're going to go from discrete action, discrete states to continuous state, discrete actions to continuous actions, discrete time to continuous time. In the, hope, in the process, you'll pick up a very, very important theorem. But really, I hope that you'll uh, pick up a lot of actual intuition. I think sometimes the continuous time formulations are actually more intuitive. Uh, and they, they shed some really important insights in those equations. Uh, and <clears throat> let's see, if we do this wrong, I'll just be have my you know, face to the board writing a lot of equations and you'll be sort of irritated uh, that I've written too many equations because uh, there are more equations today. But uh, if we do it right, you'll ask a lot of questions and you'll forget that I'm writing equations and they're in the notes, you don't have to write them down anyways. Uh, and you'll just, they'll sing to you, right? And you'll understand now uh, value iteration in a much deeper way because it's really a gradient of something. Um, I can't promise that's gonna happen, but, but uh, well, let's, that's the goal, right? It's, the equations should sing to you. Um, so let's, let's just, start the transition by just by reminding sort of the, the, the backdrop here, right? I started with a continuous system, right? In the double integrator example, for instance, right? Which, if you wanted the physical intuition for that one, that was the, 
unit mass brick being pushed with a force trying to go towards zero. Okay, um, we talked about different ways to formulate that as an optim optimization problem. We did a minimum time version of it where you just said, I, you know, I've got some limits on you, but I just want to get there as fast as possible. And that had the, the solution that we sort of convinced ourselves must have these curves uh, like this, where you do u equals negative one here and u equals positive one over here, right? And we had a nice continuous uh, understanding of that problem. And then we conjured this algorithm which said, well, you can sort of get close to that if you were to think about um, putting a bunch of discrete states on the state space. And I, and I think the, the question last time was really good. I mean, if I just draw sort of this row, it doesn't capture the fact that you know, there's, there's states over here that are actually, when you have high velocity, they jump over, right? Okay, but you could imagine sort of tiling the continuous space with discrete states and then trying to write down the discrete equations, right, where we said that um, now I have discrete states S, Sn plus one is my dynamics of Sn and some discrete choices of action. I have to take one of the edges on this graph, An. When we simplify things to discrete time, discrete state, discrete actions, and we had a cost function that was additive cost, we said that what I want to minimize ultimately is my set of actions over time that minimizes some long-term cost. That's an infinity that got really small there. In that particular case, we came up with a, um, you know, the whiz-bang algorithm that is dynamic programming and value iteration gives an extremely elegant solution to that problem. Where we observe there's a recursive structure, which is that I could write that cost as the one-step cost plus the optimal cost from the next state. Right, that was leveraging the additive structure of those equations. The crazy thing is that, that that's just a set of equations that is true for that um, cost function. another way to write exactly the same cost function, okay? But it turns out it, it also, it gave us an algorithm where we, if we, if we actually just computed this right half, hand side and made an approximation j hat of s, and we just said on every iteration of the algorithm, we'll compute the minimum over a given my current guess. take my current guess, I'll compute this right hand term, and I'll update my guess to be that. That has strong theoretical background that they'll tell you that that actually converges, and um, it converges to the optimal policy, and the optimal cost to go. Okay, but an important thing to observe is that this is not just an algorithm. First and foremost, this is a statement of um, it's a property that the optimal value cost to go function holds, you know, holds for the optimal cost to go function. And we'll see in the continuous time, this is a property that you can check, right? So if I give you a J star, I say, you know, here's your system F, here's your cost G, here's a J star, I think it's your optimal cost to go. 
you can check, right? You can tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong by just checking if that if it holds for that equation. Yeah. So I've got two questions. Um, first is, uh, does this uh, property only hold for strong, like the strong convergence? Does it only hold if you have an added cost function? The recursive property, my ability to write it like this, only holds for the recursive. So the, 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 you couldn't write the equation down if I didn't have the additive cost function. Okay. And the other thing is, for guessing your initial like uh, you know, guess of, of j hat, does that be bounded somehow? If you type infinity into your computer, it probably wouldn't go well. But um, I think that so the 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 mathematics behind the uh, proof is says that it's a contraction that um, that every time if I were to take two J's and I push them through this they get closer and that the only solution to this contraction mapping is at the fixed point which is J star so yeah don't start at infinity there's the yeah, I think that would not be good but uh, anything else is pretty good zero fine epsilon fine um, but it's a pretty strong result yeah Okay, so before, since there's going to be some complexity in the numerical implementation of these algorithms in continuous time and continuous state and continuous action, but actually the condition where I can just check, if I give you a J and I say, hey, it's optimal for the continuous time version, continuous state version, whatever, that's actually going to be fine. The, the, the math isn't going to be any harder than this version. So before we do the algorithm, let's just do the the sufficiency theorem, it's going to be called, okay? Just checking the, the property that the, that the optimal thing should, should satisfy. All right, and I'll, and I'll write here on, yeah, I'm going to sort of do it all in one step on this board just so you can have it. Available for you, and there's really, I think, not big surprises here. We're going to try to understand it carefully. So in the discrete time, I wrote my dynamics S n plus 1. And this is discrete time, state, and action. And I will subscript this with a D for discrete, so because we remember there's going to be a new F over there, and it's a different F, right? But in continuous time, we still use F, but we talk about F. Right? They're obviously, the two are, are sort of related if I'm making a discrete time approximations, but those are different uh, functions. Here we said that the objective is to minimize my, over my actions, a long-term cost that looks like this. I've been using the infinite horizon version of it because the equations are cleaner, but there's always there are versions that have different, you know, finite time and things like that. You won't be surprised then to see my objective here turns that sum into an integral, right? So now I'm going to minimize over some trajectory of u over time, some continuous trajectory, the integral of g of x of t, u of t, dt from zero to infinity. And just like this one, when you see a sum, an infinite sum, you should think to yourself, give, you know, that should, you have a knee-jerk reaction like, does that actually converge? It's not well defined if it doesn't converge, and that was some of the subtleties we got to if you, if you put a ring of impassable, you know, an impassable ring around your goal, then you're not gonna converge. Same thing's true of infinite integrals, right? We're gonna have to make sure that those Converge. We want to formulate the problem that is able to achieve zero cost at the long run, in the long run. Okay, and then my, my value, the property of my value, my cost to go function held here was the J of S equals min over A, G of S A plus J F of S A. Now this is the one that is sort of the most different, but it's sort of beautiful, okay? Now we get, for all x, I get zero equals min over u, g 
g of x u plus a partial derivative and I'll take a minute to make sure you can see where that comes from with a quick derivation and actually that gradient is beautiful that's gonna we're gonna I think understand the equations even better thanks to that gradient uh, when we're done this thing is called the Hamilton uh, Jacobi Bellman equation HJB which is sort of a cool name because you know Bellman was around, uh, was alive you know 60 years ago he was, he was doing his work 60 years ago and these guys are a little bit older than that uh, so you should strive to you know tack your name on the end of some some set of important mathematicians <clears throat> Uh, it's a partial differential equation, right? So solving that for J involves solving a partial differential equation. And really that, I mean, if you've, if you've ever worked with partial differential equations numerically, then to some extent we're done. You, you know, you could say that the, the algorithm I showed you last time was a numerical solution to the partial differential equation that is this. And, well, with one other condition. Uh, this is only a condition of the gradient, so there's a boundary condition, but we'll, under, we'll understand that in a second. Okay, but roughly the algorithms we're going to get to are numerical solutions to that partial differential equation. Okay, let's make sure we see where it comes from. Is the notation clear? S to X, A to U, N to T, right? Good. Okay. Sure. I lost this one here. Do you mean that? Yeah, but there's. What's the definition of J in the Same thing. This is uh, J of S is this where S, if I started at S0 equals S, and here J of X. Let me be. That's a good question. Good. Thank you both. Yeah, where this is started where x0 equals x. It's just that the recursive form here looked like this, and in some weird way, it's not a recursive form anymore. It's a property that J has to hold. But we'll see the continuous. It's, it's the same equation, just the terms drop away. <coughs> right, so how do you go from discrete time? So it turns out that the discrete state in uh, discrete state to continuous state, discrete actions to continuous actions, those don't actually change the math at all. I could just take these equations here, I could have written x everywhere and u everywhere. All these equations still hold. You wouldn't know how to type that algorithm into the computer because suddenly I've got to say for all x and that's a real value. But the, the, the symbols that I would write on the board would not have changed. Okay, so the, the, the bigger leap is doing the discrete time to continuous time. <clears throat> so uh, how do you do that in general, right? So you, you make some mapping like this, right, and then you start thinking of x of um, do this one. n plus 1 looks like x of t plus dt. And then you start asking for the limit as dt goes to 0 to try to understand the derivatives of that. That's roughly the mechanics that we'll, we'll, we'll follow here. So if I say that J star of X is this integral from zero to infinity 
dt of g of x u Now the analogous attempt at finding the recursion is I'm going to break off the first dt of that integral. Right? So I'll say that from 0 to dt, g of x tau u tau. Right? This, this thing, I'm going to break off the first piece and then plus j of x t plus dt. That's my sort of a, my exact analogy to it before, where this, you know, I, I could have written that as f of x, you know, but. Okay, now if I start taking the limits of this as, as dt gets small, right, then that's when it gets interesting. Oh, I, I uh, forgot my min over u, I'm sorry. I'm doing j star, I better have a min over u here. And these are u trajectories. I could be more explicit and write t in here, yes. Yeah? Okay, now let's take a limit as um, t goes to, so this is true for any dt, right? I've just written it explicitly here. But I can also say the limit as dt goes to zero, then it's gonna look like the min over u, now just a single u, a, pro a reasonable approximation of this as dt goes to zero, the right approximation is as the instantaneous x in u, no t there, times dt. Yeah? Uh, x of t plus t depends on u, so... Correct. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I get for putting in an after, thank you. That depends on you, good. Good catch. Um, and then how do I expand, you know, what happens to this as dt gets small? I'm going to write that as j star of x plus the, the now I'm going to take a derivative of this to do the, the local approximation, right? I want dj dt dt. And that, day, D, what does dj dt look like? That's partial j partial x times partial x partial t, which is f of x u. Terms are appearing, right? You see where they're coming from. Now here's the, the sort of strange part is that well, first of all, j of x doesn't depend on u. That one doesn't, actually. Um, it also actually doesn't depend on dt, so I could pull it all the way out. And the dt, I could, if it's positive, I can just pull it outside, too. I could say dt times min over u of the rest. <laughs> and I'm missing it over here and over here. Thank you for calling me. I, I appreciate it. <clears throat> And this side, just to, just to remind you, that this started as j of star of x. So, sort of crazy. Those things cancel out. You get a zero over here. The dt, if this has to hold for all the dts as dt gets small, 
then actually I can just take the DT right, out, right away. And the property that must hold is that this thing has to equal to zero. Okay? So I get back to zero equals min over u g of x u. So let's make sure that the admittedly quick derivation, but is it algebraically, does it make sense? Yeah? Yes? This one here, yeah? Exactly. It is dt, and then I put a d tau inside here. So I'm going to say I want to integrate. So this thing is integrated for all time. Yeah. I'm going to bite off just the first dt of it, keep that as an integral of g over g, and then after dt, the cost to go from x of t plus dt. So it's a limit for, it's an integral from just 0 to dt, which is approximated well as dt goes to 0 by just the value times dt. You're saying that this step to this step? Yeah. I'm okay just saying, let's assume u is, I, I actually don't know if it breaks, but uh, let's assume u is continuous for now. Isn't the limit, like, has dt for the zero, so it's kind of like a one point of u? Yeah, that, well that's, yes, that, that it does come down to that. I think this still holds if u gets, happens discontinuously, but there is some, there are some continuity requirements on the equations. Just to make sure we don't get stuck in the details, let's <coughs> permit u to be continuous, because we're going to assume it later anyways. OK, so algebraically, maybe it makes sense. But again, this is now a partial differential equation with respect to uh, j. It's a completely intuitive one, actually, if you think about it. What does it say? It says that somehow, I mean, another way to look at this is that for the optimal controller, let me insert when, you know, this says that partial j, partial x, f of x, u star. So if I found the optimal controller, that's a function of x. So let me even maybe write it as pi star of x equals negative g x pi star of x, right? So for, for u is the argument of that, for pi, pi being the argument of this, the controller that minimizes that. If I stick that back in, this thing has to equal zero. So just flipping it around, that says this algebraically. Remember, this is just dj dt. So I, I find that very powerful and intuitive that all it says, this whole equation, it looks a little scary at first, but it's just saying that my cost function, when I start going down my cost function, my cost to go function, the rate that I go down my cost to go function <laughs> is, the burn, is my cost, right? I'm incur, the, you know, my, as I, of course I'm gonna, as I'm going down, I will incur the cost g, but that means the cost to go has gotten smaller by, by that at rate g. Yeah? Okay, so I think that's a very intuitive version of, of, of those equations. Okay, so this hamilton jacobi bellman equation, HJB equation, is uh, the main piece of the hamilton jacobi bellman sufficiency theorem, which basically says that if you found a J star that satisfies this, plus a bound, you have to make sure you match a boundary condition, and I'll write that in a second here. If you found a J that satisfies this, 
then you can certify, this equation will help you certify that it's optimal for the controller that minimizes this. Yes? Uh, wait, looking at the algebraic derivation, how does this work for a non-optimal policy? How does it work for a non-optimal policy? Yeah, presumably it breaks at some point in the review, but where, like, when do we rely on the fact that we're using the minimum view? It's a good question. Your cost to go is still gonna, so, if you, so the, t the way you would typically write that, you'd call it j pi, for instance, yeah. of x. I think this property still holds. You should incur uh, cost, your cost to go, if you've, sat if you've solved this correctly for whatever pi you've satisfied, it should still incur costs like this. I think it makes its way most of the way through the derivation. You just won't have a min u here. You'll, be, you'll have done it all only for, for pi's. Because the cost you incur is still going to be equal to, the, you know, the rate at which you incur cost to go is still going to match your cost. Yes? If this is a suboptimal policy, can we be incurring costs but not necessarily reducing your cost to go function of the state you would arrive at? You would not be going, this would, you would not be able to say this about J star. Right? So it's, if you're, if you're going downhill with a suboptimal policy, you will not have this property hold for the optimal J. There's a different cost to go function, which is the truth about the policy that you're actually you're running, right? That would be called, this is typically called policy evaluation, where you could say, I've got a controller, tell me how well it works, and you can, you can figure out the cost you'd expect to incur from every state. That is a function J over the, over the state space X, and it should go downhill at that rate. That's still true. It's true that it could go uphill. If I were to plot on top of that a different function, which is J star, then executing my policy might go uphill on J star because it wasn't a good policy. But it'll, there's a J that is the truth for that policy. Okay, the boundary conditions are more subtle and, and actually the, the more formal treatments typically do it in, just in finite time. But basically you need something that, that locks this in because um, I could take any J star and add two to it, and it would still satisfy this equation, but it would be lying about my total cost to go, right? So you need something that takes that away and just puts a boundary condition in. So simplest would be that I, you know, just to, to skirt that issue for now, just say that um, x, that f of x, let's say um, f of zero times pi star of zero equals zero. So the origin is a fixed point and set j star of zero equal to zero, and then we're good. Just, just somewhere you need to set a, you know, a value for j, not just the derivative of j, to lock it in. Otherwise, you've got, a, you've got no boundary condition. And in general, it doesn't have to be there's zero cost of the origin, but that's good enough. That's uh, for everything we're gonna do today, we'll, we'll use that. Okay, so, so what I've given you now is not an algorithm yet, but it's, a, it's machinery that if I were to, to show up and say, I've got a controller, I've got a system and I've got a controller and I think it's optimal, you could say, well, prove it. And I would just whip this out and uh, convince you. And that's what I'm gonna do right now, I hope. didn't make a formal statement of that theorem, although it's in the notes, but, uh, well, it's even, even informal in the notes, really, but, because the real formal one is, got too much jargon. But uh, there's a reference to a more formal one. Uh, it does assume, since I've written something as a function of partial j partial x, partial j partial x had better exist everywhere, and uh, in fact, it should be continuous. The, you know, you want to have, the function should be continuously differentiable in the formal statement. Yeah, I was going to ask what if the J star is not differentiable. Yeah, you need a different theorem. And typically it's, uh, you know, actually you lose a lot of power pretty quickly in that case. A lot of times you go to Pontryagin if you've, if you've seen that. 
different a different tool chain. Yeah, it's like you have to change compilers or something. Um, okay, so uh, let's take my q double dot equals u example, and let me um, I'll forget about the saturation on u because that makes things discontinuous typically. Let me say my um, cost function is um, q squared plus q dot squared plus u squared. My claim is that I know the optimal policy for this. Negative q plus square root of 3 q dot. Right? Where the hell did that come from, right? So, um, so you should be suspicious, maybe? I don't know. That's a weird looking policy. But I'll prove it. Let me prove it, because I'll produce this extra certificate that says, you know, I can prove that that's optimal by giving you this extra piece of information. It's my, you know, just check. This is the, the cost to go function. Q squared plus two Q, Q dot plus square root of three Q dot squared. You know, it's, it's like crypto or something. You know, I don't, you don't have to, I don't know where I got it. If you, if I could, you know, I've given you a certificate, you can check and we're all good. You have to now believe me that it's optimal because this thing, it does actually satisfy my boundary condition I said, it's zero at zero. And this would be zero. If I plug that in, everything's good. Okay. Because, yeah. This is zero at zero. Okay. And, um, you know, just to, to run the machinery, you could, you could prove that by, now partial J, you know, when there's multiple variables here, just to exercise our machinery here, this is now gonna look like partial J, partial Q, Q dot, plus partial J, partial Q dot, Q double dot, which is U in this case, partial J, partial Q, Three times Q plus two Q dot, right? Partial J, partial Q dot should look similar. Two square root of three Q dot plus two Q. Okay. If you plug that in to the equation, which I'll spare you the handwriting, but it's easy to do. If you plug those into the equation now, you, you see the equation, right? It's, there's two things you have to check. Min over u, q squared plus q dot squared plus u squared, right? Plus partial j, partial q, q dot. Yes. Yes. It's always J star in this case. And U. So, so the first the first thing you have to check is that for this proposed J, um, if I stick that in, stick those terms in, that the min, that I can solve for the minimum over U, and it better come out to look like. Where did I write my controller? Here. All right. This is my controller. That had better be the minimizer over U. Uh, by the way, right? So this, how do I get? How do I find the minimizer over U? Right? Pi star had better be over U of that whole thing. Um, in general, last time we were doing discrete actions, so I was able to find the minimum over U by just trying every action and taking the, the best one. Here, it's a continuous function u, but luckily it's a simple one that is quadratic in u, right? So I've got some function 
I plot over u that looks like a positive quadratic, and no less. So I can take the gradient of it, and wherever the gradient is equals to zero, that's going to be my minimum. If I take the gradient of that equation, set it equal to zero, then the u that, that, at which that happens is going to be this. That's the first part of your certification. The second part of your certification is now, if I stick that u back in here, the whole thing better equal zero. Right? Those are the two things that have to happen. And they do. It's actually sort of beautiful and sort of gen and, and, and very generic that for this system and this cost, I ended up getting um, a cost to go function, which was actually, so this was, the cost was quadratic in U. The cost to go function is actually even quadratic in Q and Q dot, in X. Right, so in this case, J star was a, of X was a quadratic function. I could have written it in its quadratic form, like that. And this policy pi happens to be linear in X, and it's more familiar, more general form would be to write it like this, where I could fill in S and K with the coefficients here as, okay? And we'll see that that, that generalizes, okay? Now, it turns out if you took, we, we all, the other place we have an optimal policy so far is, um, is the bang-bang controller, right? And it turns out that if you put in the bang-bang controller here, and you put the cost function, which is the time that you can compute for following that policy and getting to the origin, here, and you run the machinery, everything checks. But the theorem says you're, Jacobi, you know, that your cost to go function has to be differentiable everywhere. Your policy, you know, the, so the theorem doesn't actually hold. But it's sort of like evidence, you know, it's like suggestive that it's, it's probably still optimal. It's sort of annoying how far you have to go to prove that the bang bang controller for the double integrator is optimal. But um, it happens to be, it, it's consistent with all these equations too. Okay, so how many people recognize that? form. It's the, it's sort of the famous uh, result of linear quadratic regulator control. So this is LQR. We're going to use LQR a lot later. It's super good. And it's sort of one of the few cases where for real systems, you can get an analytical solution. And verify it with the HJB sufficiency theorem. Any more questions about the, you know, just the, the machinery, right, about the fact that what you have to check and the, the tool? Yeah. Uh, I'm just like a little bit confused. How do you get, so if you try to do the, like, argument thing, you try to prove that, I assume you kind of differentiate the stuff inside the min, set it equal to zero. But if you do that, you get u equals negative one half um, partial j over partial q dot, which wouldn't that be? Negative q minus square root of three q dot. Let me check. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Yeah. Yeah, it's a minus. 
Yeah. yeah, it's a minus. Good call. My proof has been broken. So if you if certifying optimality, make sure you take it to completion because someone could pull a fast one on you. <laughs> um, okay. So so it turns out you can solve these equations in a pretty general form, which is if my dynamics are in this general linear systems form, ax plus bu, my cost function is in a pretty general form. Any quadratic form like this, almost any, right? I, I want q to be positive, semi-definite, and symmetric, and r to be symmetric and positive, definite for everything to go through. Why? Because if I reward you for using energy or torque, then you'll use a lot of it and the solution is infinity. Um, you need something that penalizes cost in order for the, the optimal value to be a some finite thing. Uh, and then, yeah, don't reward infinity. Reward being close to the origin. Those are reasonable things. You take this again. This is all I needed to do is conjure a Lyapunov. Or a, uh, sorry, I went ahead there. Uh, conjure a cost to go function, J, and the one I will conjure in general is I'll say I think that J star looks like this for some s, which we'll be able to find, and that the optimal policy is going to be a linear function. and we'll give you the tools to find k at s, then this is going to hold, it's going to be the optimal solution to those. Okay, and it's exactly the same thing we did there um, with the signs correct, and, uh, and it's a general purpose solution, right? So the full derivation is in your notes. It's not worth me writing the whole thing, but let me write the first step because um, there is geometric insight to be gained there. So if I do min over u, now x transpose qx plus u transpose ru plus partial j partial x times ax plus bu. What is partial j partial x? I mean, the first time I saw this, I hadn't, I hadn't seen real matrix derivatives, uh, matrix partial derivatives. It takes, I mean, if you haven't seen it, it's like, um, you have to think about it. But first of all, what size should it be? So J is a scalar and X is a vector. So the standard notation for that would be that this is going to be a row vector, which has as its elements partial J, partial X1, partial J, partial X2, okay? And it turns out to be sort of what you'd think, which is 2X transpose S, because S is symmetric. You might say, why is it not 2SX? And it's because it's a row vector. Right, this is the, the row vector. Okay, so you could stick that in here. Okay, I get a 2X transpose S. I can take the gradient of this whole thing with respect to U. Okay, so let's do that. If I take the gradient, can I use the shorthand gradient with respect to U of that whole big thing without writing that whole big thing? I get, there's only, U only appears a few times. I get 2 U transpose R plus 2 X transpose S 
B. Okay. Again, this is a positive quadratic function of u because r was forced to be positive. So if I've taken the gradient of this and found where it's zero, I found the minimizing u. So let me set this equal to zero. And what I can find quickly here is that u star or pi star is, let's see, if I get the transpose out and everything, I'm gonna pull this over to the other side, multiply by r inverse, I get negative r inverse b transpose s x. Just negative k x, aka negative k x. And um, if you were to stick that back in, this term back in to here, you can see already that I'm going to get u times something that has, you know, with it that has an s in it times, you know, something else with an s. I'm going to get that term again here. I get s transpose something in the middle, s. Okay. I need to somehow solve that for s. So the people have done that for us. That's a famous equation. It's a famous matrix quadratic equation called the Riccati equation. And it has an efficient numerical solution. But it's, it's a special algorithm for finding that, that solution. Um, and you can solve for s numerically. Yes? How do you solve for k? Or is there any reason to solve for s versus solving for k? I'm just naming this piece k. Okay. We've just changed call signs because I don't want to write that too much. And because if you go and you if you go into like MATLAB and you call LQR A B Q R, then it returns two arguments K and S. So that's how you you know you made it if you know there's a there's a MATLAB function with your name on it, right? So I'm just I'm just conforming by doing that. And then why do I need to you know, so you, you actually do solve for s explicitly, numerically, and then you basically read out k, because that k is a function of s. <clears throat> okay, so it's, it's a super powerful result, and um, very general, and it's one that we get, ex you know, by exactly, by examining the, the HJB conditions. And then finding the, the closed form solution. Yeah. yeah. How did you figure out? Like, you, you seem to have noticed that this would be linear, or I guess vector linear, whatever that means in X. Like, how did you end up with that? 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 Like, how did you end up um, in practice, I, you know, I'm not trying to be mysterious. Uh, it's just, it's just magical. You know, I mean, it's like this, this, this happens. Um, <laughs> someone else, you know, way smarter than me figured that out, and like this one's a big deal, right? And uh, it turns out it's, it's more general than that. Like when you get to piecewise affine systems, and, and there's other strong properties that, that hold that sort of fit this form. Um, but I just take it as a, as a godsend, really. I mean, it's like it makes everything easier. <laughs> Um, okay, so so I said there was there was geometry geometric insights to be gained here. So um, S X, what is S X? S X is roughly, uh, you know, it, it looks like partial J. When you see that, you should think partial J partial X transpose. Right, those, those, those are the, wherever I wrote it, over here, right? That's, this is, Sx is the gradient of the cost to go function. So, what is my optimal action for the LQR problem? It is go downhill on my cost to go function, which is a quadratic, but don't go, as, don't, 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 go down, don't go downhill as fast as possible because, I, my, well, first of all, I, I might not be able to go in arbitrary directions. The directions I'm able to go downhill on are modulated by B. 
And then my preference for which directions to go down is modulated by my cost r. So if I said using actuator 1 is 10 times worse than actuator 2, then that'll change the direction I go down that gradient. Okay, but this is again just saying the optimal policy is run down your, your cost to go function, you know, modulated by my preferences. Okay? So, um, I told you my story, right? I started with passive walkers, whatever. I said nonlinear dynamics is the whole thing. And I, I would have maybe poo pooed linear control for a, a while ago. Um, linear control is not the same as feedback linearization. Linear control, I'm totally cool with. And it's, it's a really powerful tool. This is not um, squishing the dynamics of my system. If I took a nonlinear system and made a linear approximation of it, I can do very good things to it locally. I just won't, shouldn't expect it to work everywhere, maybe. And I'll make some, you know, we'll, we'll see more and more um, evidence of that when we get into more sophisticated uses of LQR. Uh, the first time I really bought it, we were built, and uh, you know, again, we'll, when we do the more sophisticated version, but we were making a, a paper airplane basically land on a perch like a bird. And uh, I thought that was a really hard problem. It is a really hard problem. It's going through post stall aerodynamics or whatever. Linear control worked really well on that, uh, and it would do highly non-trivial things. It would it would uh, it would lose altitude to gain energy to ultimately get to the perch. It would stall early in order to go, and it was because the local gradient wherever I linearized around told me things about my nonlinear dynamical system. It just you know if I threw the plane straight at the ground, it wasn't going to do anything. But but for it's. It's actually a very, very powerful tool, and it's not, I just, the only point for today is it's not the same as feedback linearization. Local approximations, local linear approximations tell you locally how to optimally control even a nonlinear underactuated system. It captures all the underactuation. Um, and we really use this stuff a lot. Um, so one of the things we have in lab <laughs> is this crazy humanoid robot, okay? This is Atlas. A few years ago, we competed in the DARPA Robotics Challenge. We had our 400 pound humanoid had to uh, drive a car that it was too big for, by the way. It had to get out of the car, had to open doors, turn valves, pick up drills, cut a hole in the wall, walk across rough terrain, Climb stairs. Okay, the core balancing controller for that humanoid is LQR. With a few tweaks, admittedly, but actually for almost all humanoids, the core is LQR. Okay, we don't know how to do a lot better than that. It's actually one of the reasons why humanoids walk like this. Um, if you keep your center of mass at a constant height, then your dynamics are more linear. It's, a, it's like a really clever way to linearize your dynamics. Uh, and so straight out of the, so there's, there's, some, there's some cleverness, which we'll talk about when we get to humanoids, about how you linearize that system. You change coordinates to linearize that system in a way that it works really well. You change into the sort of center of mass coordinates. But even if you don't, even if you just take the original equations of motion and then try to linearize and stabilize uh, a fixed point or, or something. Um, you can do things like this. This was um, an early experiment before we texture mapped our robot in the simulator. Uh, you know, they're just balancing on one, on a toe, getting knocked from initial conditions, running an LQR controller to stabilize, and you know, it's deciding what torques to send to lots of joints and stabilizing a humanoid. Okay, so that's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff. Yes? So uh, the continuous and the discrete form of the HAB like, work for nonlinear systems, but uh, we use it to like, derive LQR here. Why, uh, what sort of problems you run into when you're trying to implement it for nonlinear systems? Good. So 
if if I wanted to solve this, once, once I replace this simple form with f of x u, the more general form, then my machinery breaks down. As soon as I could write this out, but, but even, first of all, the resulting cost to go is probably not quadratic. Almost certainly not quadratic. Even if it was quadratic, once I put this into the equation, I, wouldn't, I, I probably wouldn't be able to optimize for u, although there's cases where we can, which we, well, if we get to it today, we'll, I'll show you. And um, yeah, I mean, just I, I can't run through the same algebra when it's a more general function, and you wouldn't expect to because lots more things can happen, right? So this is a particularly special case where someone ordained that it would be quadratic and linear, and my algebra worked. What about for the recursive case? Is there like a nice way of implementing that? Good. So the equations still hold. So the, that's what the, 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 the last part of the lecture here, we'll see what if we wanted to approximate the optimal controller in a value iteration type algorithm for a more complicated F. That's what we'll do now. Do it in steps because um, the discrete the, the algorithm was really more cl clear in the discrete time, the discrete state. So I'll, this time I will change one thing at a time. So I'll go discrete states, to continuous states first, for instance. Okay, so um, yeah. What about? the more general case. Right, where I just, I have x dot equals f of x, u, and arbitrary g of x, let's say. In the discrete world, we solved that um, with an approximation on the mesh, right, on, on, a, on, a, on a graph. And we can do, you know, the, the approximation we got was good. Actually, it's worth um, connecting to that here. So, sorry to be mobile, Pete. Same thing I showed you before, <laughs> but it's on a Mac this time, it'll, and it'll, it won't disappear at the end, and it uh, simulates at a normal speed. Um, so this is the double integrator with a quadratic cost function. Do you see the, the result we just had? Sit, hiding in here, right? So this is a linear equation. That's what the policy looks like. It's a linear equation. It happens to have been saturated because I have, I still have some saturations on you, but it's trying to be linear until it smacks into the limits. Okay, that linear equation is sort of the LQR solution. And this, um, this is trying to be quadratic, right? This is the quadratic function. It's sort of very close to the LQR solution. In fact. To, to land this in Drake, I had to put a unit test in to, to uh, verify that it was close to the LQR solution so they would believe me that my algorithm was implemented correctly. And I can tell you that this number over here is uh, underestimates the cost to go. Why? Because over here, you see, so from the top, right, so the dynamics want to spin around clockwise. The dynamics up here should really, the system should really have to go way over here to come back, but because of my boundary effects, it's slamming into the boundary here and it gets to cheat. The boundary sort of helps it. The system doesn't know that it, it should have gone way over there. It, it gets to think it was closer to the, the origin. So it's sort of closer to the origin than it should be because of my boundary effects. And therefore it incurs less cost, okay? Over here, the cost is actually higher than it should be for the continuous equations. And the reason for that is primarily the difference between this and the actual linear control, 
first of all, the saturations, but I actually don't think you're going to saturate from here. More, it's the discrete actions. Because you're limited, you know, it, it, if it was able to take continuous actions all the way through here, then it would be able to achieve lower cost. But because it's constrained to discrete actions, there's also some effects of, of approximating v on, uh, uh, j on the, on, the, on the x coordinates. But in general, I think the, the dominant effects are that I have discrete actions and I have a boundary effect. But it's trying to find the optimal solution. I mean, this is like numerically pretty close to the optimal solution. Okay? Um, so for more generic things then, I could use the same type of algorithm, but man, would I like to not have those step, those staircase effects? So can we make a, a version that's actually continuous, finding the min continuously over actions? Um, it's hard to get rid of the approximation in state, but we can get rid of that one. And then this one is still making a discrete time approximation. I'd like to get rid of that too, and we'll show you how to do it. Okay, so the first thing is um, I've got to make a, an estimate of Jx. I got away with it before in my math because that happened to be quadratic. X trans, you know, this happens to be something I can represent with a finite set of numbers in a computer to arbitrary accuracy, right? I just have to populate the square matrix S. For a more general J, it could be arbitrary. I, I, can, I don't have that luxury. I have to come up with some finite dimensional approximation of whatever arbitrary function it might land to be. So I get into the game of function approximation, which um, is a large topic in and of itself. I'm just going to say, I'm going to go ahead and guess that this has some generic form with a particular type. You know, I'm just going to parameterize some parameter vector here again. And I can put some arbitrary functions here. These are tend to be called my basis functions. And if you haven't seen function approximation before, I apologize. Uh, you don't need to know the, the every every detail, but just to say that you can write down. I can guess like, oh, there might be a quadratic over here plus a you know just a dash of this, a dash of that. I can write down sine functions. I can write down whatever that are function of x, and then I'm going to say that my the cost function I'm going to make is a linear combination of those primitives. Okay, it could be radial basis functions. It could be whatever. The mesh approximation is actually you could think of it as. There's a bunch of, of, of pyramids that come down from every grid point, and you add them up to get that function, that interpolant. Okay? So then the game is, this, this is now a finite approximation of some, uh, you know, finite dimensional approximation of some arbitrary function. It's not going to satisfy the HJB conditions exactly. But I can try to make it sort of follow as close as possible. I could like say, I'd like this to be pretty much going downhill on the, as the cost goes up, and I'll you know I'll try to approximate it. So you can say then you know let's say choose k random samples in state x k. Choose a bunch of points in, in state space. At those points, I can evaluate J. I can evaluate my Hamilton Jacobi, my, my value iteration equation, and I can try to make that make those that value iteration equation true. Right? I can adjust my parameters alpha. If it's particularly convenient when alpha comes in linearly, I can adjust it um, in one in one shot. Right, I could say that I'd like, um, let me call it the desired value at my kth point is minimizing over, I still got discrete actions here, minimizing over discrete actions A, G of X, K, A, plus my guess, J hat alpha, F of, so I'm going to 
I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish that my function worked out to be that when I evaluated it at xk, uh, it worked out to be this value. Okay? It, I'm going to compute whatever that value is, and then I'm going to try to, I'm going to choose a, the next step, as the a that makes that as close to true as possible. in the special case of this linear function approximator form, not only can I just solve that because it's a least squares problem again, and I can make that update in one shot, I don't have to just do gradient descent, but the really surprising thing is that there are convergence properties saying that if I do this over and over again with a function approximator, it'll converge. We don't actually know what it's gonna to converge to. There's a gotcha there, but it'll converge. That's good, right? So assuming my problem is bounded in the, in the other assumptions. There's, you'd love to be able to say like it converges to the closest alpha to the true. That's actually hard to say. We don't actually know that. We just know it'll converge. Um, and it looks good when I plot it. So that's something. Um, okay, so does that make sense? That's how I did this. That is exactly the, that's the exa exact algorithm I ran to make those plots. I kept my discrete actions, I kept my discrete time, and I did a linear function approximator to make those plots, okay? Now, if I had had more time, and I'll probably do it tomorrow, so you can play with it this weekend, I would have done the continuous action version of that. Ah, do you wanna do continu continuous state or continuous action next, I guess? Um, Continuous time first. Uh, let's, do, let's do continuous time, although I don't think that's the major artifact here. The continuous time version of this, I could, I could replace this equation with the continuous time formulation. I could say choose alpha to sort of minimize my uh, argument over alpha now, um, sorry, argument over A, these are my parameters alpha, I have discrete actions, at, at point K I'll go ahead and compute this thing. choose alpha to try to make that, that, so this is the best A from a discrete set that I could have picked for that given my current estimate of the, of the value function. And then I'll choose alpha to minimize to argmin this, Minimizer of uh, of this big thing. There's two conditions that I'd like to, to have hold. I would like to, to have chosen the optimal action given my, my guess at the cost to go function. And then I would like that the, when I insert that optimal action back into my cost to go function, I'd like this to be the negative of that. And I can make that true, you know, in some squared sense. The same way, okay? Yes. 
Thank you. Sorry, I did that quickly, but is that, I think that's right now. Does that make sense? I'm going to ask, so I've got a current cost to go estimate. I can evaluate it. I can evaluate it for, a lot, for, every, for every state I pick. I can try a bunch of different actions and see which one would have acted best instantaneously, gone downhill as fast as possible, right? I'll take that action and say, by the way, let me update my cost to go function so that that action was predicting, that the cost to go was predicting the, the results of that action well. And you just iterate. This is likely not, because J, my finite dimensional approximation is not a perfect cost to go function, you are unlikely to be able to drive that to zero. You'll have some error always, <laughs> but you can, you, you can get an approximation, yeah. Isn't this basically the same as evaluation? It's the, it's the derivative version of evaluation, right? So I'm not, I'm not simulating forward by any time step. I'm just looking at the gradient of my cost to go function to make my decision. So it is continuous time value iteration, if you will. And it, I would even call it continuous time fitted value iteration because it's an approximation, a least squares approximation. Yes? How do I choose my uh, the number of samples or the location of the samples? Uh, Both, right? There's no good. Um, guarantees on that. So I picked it to be a uniform sampling across the state space for this, at the, you know, basically at the mesh points. For this algorithm, and actually the reason I didn't type it in before today was because at this algorithm, the mesh approximation is gradient is discontinuous at the mesh points. So picking XK is more subtle, um, but it's still possible you just pick it somewhere else. Uh, in high dimensional spaces, you can't sample uniformly over the dense state space, so you end up sampling a bit and hoping for the best. There are theorems about if you'd like to maximize your average reward of, of a the robot that's running for a long time, then the thing you should sample from is your stationary distribution. So you should sample in the places, most in the places where you spend your most time in state space, roughly. It is, but in this, it's a simple optimization problem if you choose linear function approximators. You can uh, find it in the notes. It's a, yeah, I think. Yeah, I typed. Yeah, it was. It was like just a few days ago I typed that in. So if or you can find it in the code if it's not in the notes. And you can yell at me if it's not in the notes, and I'll put it in the notes. Okay, so. Um, the last step then is, could we, we're still, we still have to search over discrete actions. And in my mind, that's the most egregious error that's being made here. So can you get rid of that? And in general, no. But in some, there are some pretty general cases that are, that where the answer is yes. So for continuous actions, There's a special case where if x dot is control affine, and there's sort of two special cases really, but if g of x u is quadratic in U, only quadratic in U, then if you write the, if you if you imagine inserting this into my function here, I get a term that's quadratic in U and a term that's linear in U over here, and it's a positive quadratic in U. And I actually can do the same LQR trick 
at a bunch of sample points. It won't hold for all x, but at any given x, I can evaluate it. So this allows you to do an argument over u analytically. The other case where you can do it is if you had no cost on u, but a limit on u, and then you get bang bang control out, and as a function of the, the bang bang control looks at the direction of your gradient and tries to go downhill with either maximum or, or minimum uh, effort. Okay? In practice, you get pretty far with those approximations. I just want you to know of the existence of something better. Uh, not many people implement the, go through the effort of implementing the extra continuous things. They should, maybe, but uh, cool. So there's a route algorithmically to being more continuous too. But I hope the biggest thing you got out is some, I, I, you know, the, the idea that cost to go is, you know, that the, the cost function, instantaneous cost, is the derivative of my cost to go, and the fact that I could, my policy should go downhill as much as possible, but modulated by my cost. These are very important intuitions that are going to extend on. So I don't know if it's saying to you or not, but uh, that was the goal. Okay. Uh, next Monday is or next Tuesday is Monday, right? It's a it's a Monday is a Tuesday. So I guess I'll see you in a week.